All right, Gilbert Land, let us jump into Chapter 8, Vocabulary, Chapter 8. And Jared, of course, deals with America becoming an empire, American imperialism. And let us get right to the vocabulary terms. Let us begin with, number one, obviously, foreign policy. Now, foreign policy refers to any nation's policies toward other nations. So, uh... America dealing with Mexico, that's foreign policy. America dealing with Russia, that's foreign policy. So foreign policy, any nation's policies toward other nations. Now, for decades, our foreign policy had essentially been neutrality. We had become neutral in the world. This is due to Washington's farewell address was in which he had warned us, America, to stay out of European entanglements, uh, to stay out of the business of Europe, and they would leave us alone. And to be perfectly honest, this worked well for us uh, as a growing nation. We were not really physically ready to take on European powers in war, though we did in the War of 1812 after uh, Washington had warned us not to. That ended in a tie. We did take on Mexico and the... Mexican-American War in the 1840s, which ended in a victory for us, which led to the acquisition of Texas and a huge uh, amounts of land in the southwest part of the United States, which unfortunately, of course, also led to the Civil War. And then, of course, we do have the Spanish-American War, uh, which we are covering in this chapter. So uh, neutrality had worked well for us, and as the 1800s end, we are, as a nation, growing militarily, economically, and we're willing to sort of step away from neutrality and get more involved in world affairs, which takes us to number two, the Spanish-American War. Now, we've covered this already in great depth and detail and the other PowerPoint, but the definition that you need to be aware of for quizzes and for the test, the Spanish-American War ended Spain's empire in the Western Hemisphere. And, and this is important, and America became a world power it acquired several possessions, Cuba and the Philippines just being two, Puerto Rico and Guam being a couple others. So the Spanish-American War, 1898, America defeats Spain in this war, and we acquire several Spanish possessions, Cuba, Puerto Rico in the Caribbean, and the Philippines and Guam in the Pacific. This now makes America a world power, a, an empire, if you will. Pulitzer and Hearst kind of go together, and they are as responsible as anyone for yellow journalism. Now, Pulitzer was a newspaper owner. Uh, the New York World was one of his newspapers. He and his paper sensationalized news depicting the Spanish as being Murderous Barbarians, which of course is the definition of yellow journalism. Hearst was a newspaper owner. His newspaper was called the New York Journal, who sensationalized news depicting the Spanish treatment of the Cubans. Okay, so Pulitzer and Hearst, two leaders in American uh, newspapers. Pulitzer, of course, has a prize named after him, the Pulitzer Prize is awarded yearly to the best writers on the planet, uh, poets, uh, novelists, works of fiction, whatever the case may be. Hearst, at one time, he and his family controlled hundreds of newspapers, and they probably still control several dozen of them today. These are two pioneers in America's newspaper industry. And yet, because of the fact that they wanted to see America become an empire, they used the resources, the newspapers, to spread yellow journalism, which is, by definition, the sensationalizing of news events in order to sell more newspapers. Now, we could add to this in order to sell more newspapers, yes, indeed, but in this case, also to push an agenda. Their agenda was war with Spain, which would then lead America to becoming an empire, which is what Pulitzer and Hearst both wanted. Now, the Spanish then helped themselves. They did a lot of dumb stuff. One of them was referred to as the Delome Letter. Now, this letter was written by a Spanish ambassador named Delome. 
in this letter, which was intercepted and eventually published in American newspapers, this letter of the Loams criticized President McKinley, President William McKinley, who was president during the Spanish-American War, criticized him and called him weak. Okay? Weak. Now, we've already discussed this in some detail previously. This was a huge insult. And every American, even if you did not like McKinley, was offended by this, partially because of the fact that our president's being insulted by the Spanish, and there really wasn't a lot of love aimed at the Spanish at that time, and partially because many people saw this as an avenue to war. And of course, you've got to take into account the fact that the yellow journalist, let me circle that there with a little bit of different color, yeah, I like that. Uh, the yellow journalists were pushing any and everything they could get their hands on toward war. And in fact, Pilcher sent down a photographer at the time. I want to say it's Remington, but that, that's probably not right. Anyway, sent down a photographer and told the gentleman, you get the pictures and I'll start the war. So essentially what he tells him, you go take pictures of events and I will build a story around them to fit the narrative I want told. Not what is true, but what I want told. Let's move on to the next slide. And we're going to do about 18 terms, three slides, and then we'll stop it because I don't want to get this, make this too long. Anyway, number seven, the USS Maine, an American warship. It was a battleship which exploded in Havana Harbor. Now, Havana Harbor is, of course, the harbor found uh, near the city of Havana, which is the capital city of Cuba at that time, and it still is to this day. This act was blamed, this act of war. You blow up an American or any warship, that's war. So this act was blamed upon the Spanish by the yellow journalist Pulitzer and Hearst. Now, as I've explained previously, did the Spanish blow up the main? I have no idea. It could have been. I don't see a reason for it. In fact, it doesn't make sense for the Spanish to do so unless they were just telling America, get out of Cuba, it's ours. Now, of course, we did have a great deal of money invested in Cuba. Okay. It could have been uh, the act of an arrogant empire that was well past its prime, not really realizing that they were no longer truly consequential in the world. That's entirely possible. Like a you know, 50-year-old woman dressing half her age to impress people, putting on way too much makeup, wearing a skirt way too short, Spain may have felt that they were truly relevant in the world, but they were not. And if they felt that way, they were that arrogant, maybe they did attack the main and blow it up, sending us a message. If they did, we got the wrong message. We were not afraid. We got angry. Now, two other possibilities besides the Spanish attacking the main, which is what Pilots and Hearst wanted everybody to believe, it could have been the Cubans. It makes more sense to me that the Cubans would attack the main knowing that the Spanish would be blamed, we would then enter the war on their side and essentially free them from the Spanish, which, of course, they then felt that we would free them, not realizing we would keep them as a territory for about the next 50 years. Oh, well, things don't always work out the way you plan, but see, that does make more sense to me. Probably the best answer to the question, what happened to the main, was it was just human error. As we discussed Steam engines, uh, particularly early on in our nation's history, had problems. And if you did not constantly watch the steam engine, if you did not constantly monitor the gauges and too much pressure built up, an explosion could result. And that's possible. Number eight, Teddy Roosevelt. Teddy was an important figure in the late 18, early 1900s. In addition to being a war hero, he becomes president, the first progressive president, the first conservationist president. We've got a bear named after him, a little cute, huggy kind of little stuffed animal, teddy bears. They come from Teddy Roosevelt. 
uh, avid game hunter. I mean, he was a Renaissance man. He did a lot of stuff. He was extremely important to our history. Well, for our purposes, uh, Teddy was the former assistant secretary of the Navy who resigns his position, volunteers, and leads a cavalry unit, the Rough Riders, into the Spanish-American War. They are involved in the most well-known battle of the entire war, the Battle of San Juan Hill, and Teddy becomes the biggest hero to emerge from that war. Now, again, as we have discussed, America loves to elect heroes. America loves heroes. And Teddy eventually takes that hero-ness that he acquired during this war and parlays into it to the VP spot for McKinley and then present when McKinley is assassinated. Number nine, imperialism. The act of creating or acquiring colonies to become an empire. We had never really truly thought about being an empire prior to this, partially because of our neutrality, partially because of our belief in self-determination, self-government, which of course being an empire kind of goes against that, partially because of our experiences as a colony of an empire, England, but as the new century dawns, a new way of thinking also dawned. Part of this desire to become an empire is based on the book written by uh, Admiral Alfred T. Mahan, the book, The Influence of Sea Power Upon History, which was written in 1890, argued for a strong navy. You've got to have a strong navy. Three-fourths of the world is covered with water, and if you're going to be an economic power, you need to be a military, a naval power as well, which is what Mahan argued. He was also a leading advocate for imperialism. He was a person pushing for America to acquire territories. The Platt Amendment gave the United States the right to intervene in Cuban affairs at any time. We discussed this briefly as we were looking at the chapter. Essentially, America held a gun, not literally, but metaphorically, to the Cuban's head and said, Okay, you have to agree to the Platt Amendment. Well, I don't care if you don't like it. You're going to do what we say. Why? Because we're in charge. So essentially, the Cubans traded the Spanish for America. Well, of course, America and Americans treated the Cubans better than the Spanish did. But it's still not the same thing as being free, which is what the Cubans had hoped for when we came in on their side fighting against the Spanish. Number 12, Queen Lilio Kalani, Queen Lil. The hereditary ruler of Hawaii, she was the queen of Hawaii. Monarchies tend to be that way. Son, uh, father gives his uh, position as king to the son, the son to his daughter, whatever the case may be. Anyway, Queen Lil fought against the American interest in Hawaii, which was growing. We had spent a lot of money, a lot of time developing sugar, pineapple plantations. We had spent a lot of time and money developing infrastructure roads, for example, in Hawaii, and she was not happy with the direction it was taking. She was afraid that our influence would become too large and something that the Hawaiian people could not overcome. So she was opposed to it, but unfortunately for her, she eventually lost. All right, let's go to our last slide we're going to look at with this particular video. One of the architects of Queen Lilio Kalani being removed from the position she had been born into, Queen of Hawaii, was Sanford B. Dole. Now, Mr. Dole was one of the leading Americans in Hawaii. He had uh, spent a great deal of money developing pineapple fields, uh, helping to get infrastructure built in Hawaii. And when he and other Americans, again, wealthy Americans who had a lot of money invested in Hawaii, learned that Queen Lil was trying to force Americans out, he and others overthrew her. While she was, or after she'd been overthrown, he led Hawaii's provisional government until America annexed the islands about seven, eight years later. Uh, toward the end of the Spanish-American War. He then served as governor for Hawaii for a few years. 
and of course eventually Hawaii becomes a state. But it was people like Dole, who by the way, his family, a cousin of his I believe, started the Dole Pineapple Company. It was people like Dole that overthrew Queen Liliuokalani and then made it possible for America to annex Hawaii and eventually Hawaii becoming a state. John Hay, U.S. Secretary of State, he was the man who was Secretary of State during McKinley's term when the spheres of influence had been created in China. We were looking toward China for trade. Europe, who had gotten there a little bit before us, had divided China into small little spheres, small little regions, and each country got to trade and control that region. We didn't like that because we didn't have one. I mean, let's not lie to each other. America was looking to make money off of China. Not anything necessarily wrong with that. But we felt that what would be best for us would be what we refer to, what Hay referred to as an open-door policy. That any country can trade with China anywhere in China. That you European countries can't divide China and expect the rest of us, the rest of the world, to buy it, to, to stay out of China. China's too rich. China has too many resources. China has too many potential markets for us, the United States, to allow that. And so the open door policy was created. Now, it wasn't fully implemented until after the Boxer Rebellion. Now, what was our open door policy? We believe that all nations should be able to trade with China. Now, did we ever ask the Chinese? No. What did the Chinese do? Boxer Rebellion. The youth of China, the Chinese youth, uh, young men, yeah. some women probably, uh, teens, 20s, uh, opposed our interference uh, in China. And so these young people opposed what we, the Westerners, not only us, but Europeans, were doing in China. And they led a rebellion against the West. Now, they lost, and they lost big. We call it a boxer rebellion because a lot of them use what we would call karate, kung fu, martial arts. Uh, most of them were unarmed except for their own hands and fists or knives and sticks. And of course, when the West, including America, sent an army to China to put this down, they were relatively easily able to uh, put down the boxer rebellion. But by then, there had been a lot of bloodshed, a lot of angry feelings, which persisted for a long time. Though... The open door policy now becomes law as a result of the Boxer Rebellion. A lot of the Chinese resented it. Last two we want to look at deal with Teddy. Number one, Panama Canal. We wanted a canal across the isthmus of Panama because it would save thousands of miles of steaming time if you were, for say, for, say for example, wanted to go from San Francisco to New York. You would have to go all the way down the coast of South America, around the southern tip of South America, which is stormy for a good chunk of the year. In certain times of the year, you can't even sail through that area. And then up the coast of uh, South America to your destination. Building a canal across Panama, which is the most narrow part of the Americas could save you thousands and thousands of miles and months of travel. And in business, time is money. Now, unfortunately, the French had tried this a few years before and failed. Also, unfortunately, Panama was controlled by Nicaragua. So we kind of made a deal with the Panamanians that if we helped you get free from Nicaragua, you would let us build a canal. They said, yeah, I mean, it's a good deal for them. So one day, Teddy sends a fleet of ships off the coast of Panama. The Panamanian leader points out the sea to the Nicar Nicaraguan, standing there beside him. Hey, look, our buddies are here. You better leave. Nicaragua left, and we built a canal across the Isthmus of Panama, which we controlled until Jimmy Carter gave up control of it uh, about 20 years ago, 25 years ago, which is stupid. Never mind. Uh, so the Panama Canal was built. Man-made canal across the Isthmus of Panama, all kinds of problems. We're talking about swamps, yellow fever. Talked about this in, uh, briefly in the Chapter 8 we, uh, video. Uh, yellow fever, we discovered, was uh, carried by mosquitoes. 
So we drained the swamps. We developed uh, poisons to kill the mosquitoes. We came up with vaccines to protect us from it. America has been like that since day one. You present us a problem, we solve it. Whether it is to build a canal across the Isthmus of Panama or to put men on the moon. That's the way we have always been. Our final one in this uh, little video is the big stick policy. Now, this is a phrase that Teddy used a lot, particularly toward foreign policy. And he would say, you need to walk softly but carry a big stick. Essentially meaning that you don't have to yell and run and jump up and down and scream and go, look at me, we're America. We're the biggest, baddest, smartest, prettiest, richest country on the planet. Do what we say. No. Walk softly, but carry a big stick. And if they don't agree with you, <laughs> hit them over the head with it. Not necessarily literally, but it could be figuratively. Figuratively, uh, where you hurt them economically. You stop trade with them. Or it could be literally using our military to enforce our policies upon other nations. Okay, we're going to stop this video, and we will pick it up later on uh, with number 19. And thank you. Bye.